we had the pleasure of sitting down with a very special guest, a person who's gone through a remarkable and personal journey from rising as a prominent figure in the far right to now living his life as a practicing Muslim. We uncover a new side of Jordan Ranklavren. We touched upon a lot in this podcast, including his upbringing in the Netherlands, the events that led him to join and then later leave the far right, to the personal doubts and questions he held towards his former beliefs. Now, this was nothing short of an incredibly moving and emotional conversation. We hope you enjoy. Assalamu alaikum to you guys at home. Today we have a very, very special guest, someone who we've been trying to get on for such a long time. And alhamdulillah, we're finally here. This is an incredible honor to have our brother joining us all the way from the Netherlands, Brother Jordan Van Klaven. Brother Jordan, how are you today? Alhamdulillah, thank you very much. It's a, it's a great honor for me uh, to be on your show. So uh, thanks. There's plenty to, uh, to discuss. And we also joined of our dearly beloved brother, Kamal. Inshallah. And you've also got this brilliant book, an autobiography that I highly encourage everyone to read, inshallah, covering your story, including the intricate details. I mean, that's one of the, that's one of the reasons why we're here today. It was after picking up your book. I was like, this is, this is incredible, Brother Jerome. Brother Jerome, let's, inshallah, let's just get started. I would love to start from the beginning of your story. Now, this is, like I said, an incredible story and not something that you come across every day. For those who don't know or f not familiar with your story, could you give us in 60 seconds, maybe in a minute or two, what was your life like? Well, what are you known for? Somebody says Jordan van Klaveren. What, how would you give that in a nutshell? Yeah, <laughs> like a bitch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, um, I, uh, yeah, well, my name is Jordan van Klaveren and I uh, once was uh, a member of uh, the Dutch parliament and a representative for the uh, PVV, that's the Freedom Party, the anti-Islam nationalist party in uh, in the Netherlands. And I was the spokesperson on the subject of Islam, so the core subject of uh, of the party. Well, and I tried to, did everything I could to, to fight Islam, basically. Mm. And after writing a book, it took me about uh, three years. Uh, I was uh, originally planned to be a, an anti-Islam book, but halfway through, it changed into the search for God, and it ended up with me uh, becoming a Muslim. SubhanAllah. Okay, would I be able to ask you, can you, I guess, point out the first instance of your life where you were exposed to Islam? The first? Yeah, the first instance. I think I was like six, six years or something or seven. And I had this, uh, well, in, in the Netherlands we play uh, football. Soccer, yeah. I, I think you call it soccer or football. They call it soccer, well, yeah, yeah, but we call uh, it soccer. Yeah, yeah okay, the Britain well. me says football. Sorry. Yeah, it's it's football. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> uh, we uh, uh, we used to play football in, in the Netherlands uh, when I was younger. We played a lot, and uh, one of my best friends there was a guy called a guy. Well, we were six or eight years old. Uh, his name was uh, Walid, but we Wally. call him Wally. But Wally. but we did it though. We called him Wally. <laughs> Uh, and uh, he was uh, he was a young kid, and he was half Egyptian, half Dutch. His mother was Dutch, and his father was Egyptian. But his father left his mother when he was basically a baby, mm. so he took off and he left the mother alone. But his mother was a Christian, and he was Muslim. And she, although she couldn't uh, speak Arabic, and although she didn't know anything about Islam, she had a, a very big painting on the wall and it was like a calligraphy so you saw the name i don't know of course because i, I can't remember exactly what it said but perhaps it was the name of, of allah ta'ala it's something like that written in a very beautiful way uh, and, and one day we we uh, stood in front of the the painting and i asked him hey Wally, what what does it say and he said i don't know <laughs> let's oh, well. ask mom he asked his mother and his mother said i don't know either <laughs> but the only thing i got left from your father and he was a muslim and mm. i promised him and he promised me as well although he left me alone with you we promised 
uh, we would raise you as a Muslim. But she said, I don't know anything about Islam. I don't know how a Muslim lives. I don't know what a Muslim should do, whatever. But this is the only thing I have. So this is for you. And mm. that, that was the only, that was the first thing that I remember when it comes to Islam or Muslim. So that's it. Wow. But that sounds like, I wish I could have seen it. That sounds amazing. Uh, Brother Jordan, you mentioned that you're part of the PVV party, the Freedom Party. Now, to my understanding, this isn't any ordinary party that wasn't entirely focusing on, you know, social reform or uh, the economy. But am I right in saying that the whole, the foundation of this party was actually just to combat uh, the rise of Islam? Would I be correct in saying so? Yeah, that is. Wow. Yeah, it's, 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 that was... Uh, yeah, it's really strange, of course, but uh, that was like uh, in, in the Netherlands and I think in a lot of other countries as well. It's like the Green Party, they fight for better environmental stuff. Mm -hmm. You've got uh, uh, classic right-wing organizations or political parties who are uh, all into politics uh, when it comes to economy, for example. You have labor parties fighting for the, for the, for the, uh, the people in the, in the factories and stuff like that. And in the Netherlands, we had this party and still there, of course, it was the Freedom Party. It was founded to fight Islam. It was mm -hmm. the core. And everything else was, uh, yeah, wasn't that important. It was all about Islam. Joram, yeah, I three three each, but... I've always had this uh, philosophy in the back of my mind that many of the anti-Islamic advocates, for instance, the man who burnt the Quran that we saw in Sweden, yeah. I personally have an inclination to believe that most of these people don't genuinely hate Islam but rather they are more in love with the limelight they receive for hating on Islam. So they are in love <laughs> with the fame they receive for hating yeah. on Islam. Attention. Can I ask you a question? During your time, mm. during this far right party, did you have a sincere hatred of Islam? Or was it, I guess, incentivized by the party? Mm. By if you hate on Islam, you will rise in rank amongst the party. Was it yeah. a sincere hatred of Islam? Yeah, I really, I really hated Islam. Okay, wow. Yeah, and, and it's a lot of people ask me, well, Geert Wilders, that's uh, the founder of the party, and he's, so, so to say, the, the godfather of anti-Islam politics in Europe. Um, they they always say, well, when I talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, or we see him on television, or he does uh, some kind of an interview, he always looks so laid back and so very kind and nice. Does he really hate Islam? But he does. <laughs> I always tell people, of course, that people can be very friendly, um, but that doesn't uh, mean that the ideas they have can be very twisted. Mm -hmm. And he really hated Islam. But when it comes to Geert Wilders, it has to do because I talked to him many times about why he had this aversion against Islam. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, when he was a younger uh, guy, like 18, 19 years old, he traveled to the Middle East and he lived in Israel for a very long time and he worked on a kibbutz and a kibbutz is like a collective farm, so to say. And it was in the 80s. And of course, in the 80s, you had uh, like uh, uh, the war in the north with the Golan, mm -hmm. with uh, nice. Hezbollah and uh, yeah, yeah. So, and he saw this these rockets coming in on their farm, and he says, "Well, the, and the people over there told him, yeah, there's the the Muslims are shooting at us, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. So there was his first experience there with Islam, so to say. Then he went to Syria and Jordan, and he he stayed there for a time. He said, "Well, I've I've met a lot of nice people there, but when I look at the countries, uh, they're all wrecked, they're all devastated, and the way they treat their women, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And it has to do with their religion. That's Islam. Islam preaches this way of life, and that's why they are so backwarded, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So then he came back, and he was still in the the Liberal Party uh, of the Netherlands, and that's it's the same party of our current Prime Minister, Mark Rutte. Um, and he left the party in uh, 2004, I think 2003, 2004, because of a discussion about uh, Turkey, the mm -hmm. country. And they, uh, they they promised in the European Union that Turkey could become a member state of the EU. And he said, well, that will never happen because it's an Islamic country okay. and we are a Christian uh, continent, so to say. So he said, well, I don't want to have talks no matter what. And they told him, well, we have to, etc. He said, well, if you don't 
explicitly say that Turkey will never be a member state as long as we are in, in uh, government, then I'll leave the party. I said, well, well, we're not saying that. So he said, well, I'll leave the party. So he left the party because of his idea that Turkey could become a member state in the future. And he said, I don't want to have Turkey as a member state because it's an Islamic country. It's a country yeah. Then he left. And that was the same year that uh, a famous filmmaker, Theo van Gogh, he was murdered in the murdered Netherlands. Him. They shot him and they tried to slit his throat and it, they st uh, stuck a knife in his stomach with a letter on it. And on the letter was uh, was for Ayan Hirsi Ali, you know, Ayan Hirsi Ali perhaps. She's yeah. famous, she lives in Kansas. She used to be a member of the Dutch parliament as well. And she was in the same party and she was a friend of Geert Wilders. So she talked with uh, with Geert Wilders a lot about Islam and her own experience in Somalia, et cetera, et cetera. Half of the things she said uh, later on uh, weren't true. But it's another story. But um, it, he was there, so he he was influenced in many ways, um, and uh, that that made him in the end anti-Muslim. And of course, uh, every th everything he said uh, got a reaction from Muslims in first of all, of course, the Netherlands. So he got a lot of hate from the Muslim community, and of course, he said very hateful thing. So it was like a spiral, so to say. So the first experiences, him in the Middle East, Ayan Hirshi Ali, Turkey, murder of Theo van Gogh, the things he said, etc. So that made him that made him very anti Islam. I mean that's very sad to hear. I mean it's it's quite interesting that he's actually forgotten perhaps maybe the symptoms as to why these things have occurred and you know the history of, of all this. Um, but it's also quite sad that if he's in Syria and Palestine and in Jordan you know, these are actually quite rich places for people to study Islam to for, meet so, to meet Muslims, to actually sit. I'm sure he would have been around with a lot of the luminous scholars that we had, uh, God rest their souls, um, in Syria and in, in Palestine and in Jordan. But I guess um, my question would be to you next, Brother Joram, is that what, for you specifically, why was Islam this alien thing? I mean, I can understand as to what this uh, your former uh, colleague, Good leader, had, had told you. But I guess on your own individual journey, I mean, how did this kind of hate, as we've said, culminate into no, you know, joining the PVV? What, why was Islam Go this on. alien thing? And why did people hold this kind of view that Islam is this foreign, foreign thing and a threat to our way of life? Because I think I've heard you say before that, you know, your party represented freedom and Islam is basically the full stop in, in ending that freedom. Yeah, that was the, the narrative. So uh, Islam is everything but freedom. But freedom. Yeah. That was it's it's like like a slogan almost. Um, yeah, but why did I hate Islam? Well, that, with me it has to do a little bit with the way I was brought up in a theological way. It was not so much that my parents told me to hate Muslims or, or whatever, because where I lived in Amsterdam was in the eighties. There were practically no Muslims in the area I lived. I lived in a, a, a part called the Balmer, and it was more. Uh, there were a lot of. Uh, uh, artists back then and uh, people from Suriname and uh, was uh, a lot, but there were no Muslims. So it had, it had nothing to do with that. And uh, the, the only Muslim I knew back then in, in, the, in the first years of my youth was uh, Wani, the guy we talked about. Mm. Uh, um, but uh, I was, uh, I was very, we were very uh, traditional in a, in a way. When you look at the church we were a member of, was the, the Reformed Church of the Netherlands. Uh, we were one of the last, I think, families in Amsterdam because Amsterdam, of course, very liberal uh, city, very secular city, but we weren't. Uh, so we were still practicing. We pr uh, prayed before dinner, after dinner, to church. We all got baptized. We all got biblical names. My grandfather was uh, like a health minister, so to say. So we were very Christian in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, we read from the Bible. Um, but uh, I was kind of a nerdy guy as well, so I loved to read a lot. And what I did was reading about my own religion because I wanted to understand why am I a Christian, what is Christianity, why aren't the other uh, religions in the world true, uh, stuff like that. So when I was, let's say, 14, 15, 16 years old, and I read a lot of books, and one of the books, um, one of the, the people I read a lot from was uh, Erasmus and um, Martin Luther, Martin. and those were big names. Yeah, Martin Luther. Not Martin Luther Erasmus. King, to anyone that's thinking that at home. This is the other Martin Luther. No, no, Martin Luther, Luther King was uh, <laughs> centuries and centuries later yeah. in the U.S. This is Germany, this is the year 1517. Uh, Martin Luther started the Reformation, and the Reformation was like the separation from the Catholic Church, because mm -hmm. 
he said, well, there are a lot of things in the Catholic Church that aren't really Christian and that mm -hmm. aren't in the Bible. So let's go back to the Bible, the Bible only. The Bible says sola scriptura in, uh, in Latin. <laughs> so uh, this guy wrote a lot uh, about uh, Islam as well and was always in a negative way because of the context back then, the, the geopolitical context, because the Ottoman Empire back then was the big enemy of European uh, states. And uh, so when they said, we're writing about the other with a capital O mm -hmm. that he explained to the people in his time and his context in his part of the world why the other people were so horribly wrong and scary etc and so because they were Muslim so he wrote about Islam in a very negative way he even wrote about uh, the prophet and he called him the Antichrist so mm -hmm. like so to say Dajjal, Dajjal yeah. Um, yeah so that influenced me because of course these were the big names in my own tradition. And when I asked the minister and I asked him, is this true? He said, well, yeah, that's true. It's true. So but he, he also told me, you have to be kind and friendly towards the Muslim people because they don't know. They're just trapped in their religion, so to say. But this religion is, is from the devil. So don't just spend too much time reading about uh, Islam because it won't serve you in uh, in that sense. So that was the first way I was formed or shaped, let's say, when it comes to anti-Islam sentiments. Then in 2001, I started uh, going to university and I, stu uh, I studied comparative religion at Free University in Amsterdam. Uh, but the first day I went to college was September 11, 2001. So there would be a tech on the World Trade Center in New York. So I already had this bias to us. <laughs> Muslims and Islam, and then I saw these guys flying in in a building with with two airplanes, as killing uh, I don't know how many people. I thought, okay, they, these people are really crazy. Mm -hmm. And then a few years later, this guy Theo van Gogh, we just talked about, he was murdered not too far away from my old house in Amsterdam. Wow. And I saw, okay, jihad has come, uh, came to Europe, so to say. Sure, so I thought, okay, well, now. Sure. Yeah, and I thought, well, that do we ha I have to do something to protect the country from all these crazy people, this mostly with their devil ideology, et cetera, et cetera. So what can I do to change uh, the way things are going now and go into politics? Because then you are the most influential uh, in a way. So I can change the law, et cetera, et cetera. And then I, and in the same year, in 2004, Geert Wilders left his liberal party, the, the party of our current prime minister, and he started his freedom party. And he said, well, the core message is fighting Islam. Islam is alien to mm. the Judeo-Christian Europe, Islam, et cetera, et cetera. So, and I thought, well, this is the guy. And I wrote him a letter, old school letter with a pen, not an email. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, well, of course you can join. So uh, in short, this is how I ended up with uh, the freedom party. How did your parents react to that? But did, how, yeah. did they, how did they They're receive this news? <laughs> yeah. Well, m most of the Protestant people aren't that anti-Islam, <laughs> of course. Uh, but uh, no, they, they weren't uh, too happy about it. Well, my father uh, passed away a long, long time ago, so he uh, never um, experienced the whole uh, journey, so to say. Mm -hmm. But my mother did, and especially my grandfather. My grandfather was a very important uh, person in my life. And he was like, like I said, he was a very Christian person. And he told me that he couldn't understand why I was joining the Freedom Party because he said he's a secular guy, he's an atheist. So why would you want to work for an atheist when it comes to politics? He had this small, very Christian organization in the Dutch parliament. It's called the SGP. It's, a, uh, it's like, the, it's almost a party from the church I was a, a member of in, in the past. And he says, well, you have to join the SGP. That's the normal way to do because this guy, he's like a market guy. He screams a lot and he's an atheist. <laughs> and of course, uh, my grandfather was from this tradition that didn't like Islam in a way. But there was this, uh, there were like it's almost, uh, like there were two, two faces when it comes to Protestantism and Islam, there are two faces. One, on the one side, they say, well, Islam is from the devil. And then the other, uh, there's this other part of the tradition that says, well, no, Islam is far nearer to us than, for example, Catholicism. Mm. And like I said, in uh, other conversations, uh, when you look at the history of the Netherlands, um, the Netherlands was liberated uh, in a way with the help of the Ottoman Empire. 
and of course they were Muslims. And uh, the the king, the f the founding father of the Netherlands, uh, William of Orange. That's why we always have the orange shirts when we play soccer or football. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he he wrote a letter to the, the the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire centuries ago, asking for help. Can you mm -hmm. give us money? Can you give us weapons, etc.? And they did. So they helped us. And there's still this um, this festival. It's called uh, Leiden's Onset. It means the liberation of Leiden. It's a seventh city in the Netherlands. Uh, and every year in October they celebrate it and they used to wear shirts with a half moon on it, uh, a crescent moon. And they mm -hmm. said, uh, we'd rather be Turkish than Papish. And we yeah. translated it into normal English. It Most says, I'd rather be a Muslim than a Catholic. Yeah. So this church, this, 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 this tradition was in my church very much alive still. Oh. So my grandfather always said, well, I'm not too fond of Islam. Uh -huh. But don't forget, we are here partly because of them. <laughs> so. so so you went ahead and you decided to write a book proving Islam as a false religion. This was a very, I guess, a bold statement of yours, very bold move of yours to write an entire book proving Islam as false. At what point during that process of writing the book did you realize, hang on, I've got something wrong. Mm. There may be some truth towards Islam. When did the At what drop? point? Yeah, well, um, I, I perhaps like a, like, a, like a little intro why I start writing the book. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the Freedom Party, it's not allowed to write books on Islam uh, if you're not Geert Wilders, because he was, so oh, to wow. say, the poster boy of the anti-Islam oh. movement. Uh -huh. So I, he wrote a couple of books and I wrote with him. So, but there was no, uh, it was not really a book of mine, of course. Uh, there were other people there that said, well, perhaps you can write it. No, I am the guy who writes the books. Mm -hmm. He is the fake, he's the name, and that. So, and that's okay because uh, when you look at it from a PR technical perspective, it's, that's okay. But it was always kind of superficial. And I thought because I studied comparative religion and I was a practicing Christian, he wasn't. So I thought, well, I have to explain to the people why I think from a theological and from an academic perspective why is islam such a danger and in 2014 i uh, left the party i left the freedom party uh, because uh, we got into a discussion about uh, a statement he made during a rally he said do you want more or less moroccan people in the netherlands and the whole crowd started shouting less 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 and he said well i'll make that happen and i uh, i i did many debates about moroccan in combination with Islam, because they most of them are Muslim. So, but now he left the Islam part out. Now so it's racism. I told, yeah, and I told him, well, what's this? Movie? Yeah, and of yeah. course I was very hateful when it comes to uh, Islam, but I wasn't per se hating Moroccan people or mm -hmm. people from Belgium, whatever. I, I just hated everybody who was uh, part of Islam. So I thought, well, that's kind of crazy because, and a lot of people don't know that, but there were always also people working from, uh, with a background from Turkey, Morocco, etc., in the Freedom Party. But of course, those were not Muslim. Most mm -hmm. of them were ex-Muslim or secular or whatever, but they were Moroccan ethnically. So I told them it's kind of a betrayal because they fight with us against this evil ideology called Islam, but now you betray them. He said, well, yeah, that's collateral damage. And I thought, well, okay, that's not that's not my cup of tea. So we got into this discussion. I said, well, we have to change it a little bit, or that add something to the narrative, or explain to the people what do you mean with less Moroccan? Do you mean less Islam or whatever? And he said, no, this is it. And I said, well, then I'll leave. And then I left. And then I finally had the time to fulfill my long-held desire, writing an academically, theologically based book when it comes to Islam. And, but um, when I was younger, like I said, I, I read a lot of books um, uh, on my own tradition. And after I studied uh, comparative religion, uh, the doubts I had as a youngster, they intensified in a way. And it were doubts about the dogmas of Christianity, like, the, the for example, the Trinity, the mm -hmm. crucifixion of Christ, uh, the atonement, uh, original sin, the, the real big dogmas in uh, the Christian theology. And I had some doubts because sometimes I, I didn't find it very logical. And for example, when it comes to the Trinity, um, I, I asked um, many ministers, I even went to some priests from the Catholic Church 
with this question. It's kind of strange because I was, of course, from this other <laughs> church. Uh, and I asked him, how, how is it that Jesus Christ is praying on the cross if he is God himself? Mm. He talks to who? I said, well, he talks to his father. I said, but he is his father because he is God. Mm. No, he's not the same person, but he is God. I said, well, he said, well, there are three persons and those three persons together see. are the essence of God. So three I thought, guys. yeah. Yeah, I, 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 and I thought perhaps I'm just too stupid. I, I am, it's a I'm mystery, dumb. isn't it? it? I mean, yeah, and, and yeah, that, that's what one of the priests said. Yeah. Well, Yoram, uh, you don't have to ask so many questions because in the end, uh, God is a mystery. Mm. I said, yeah, that's not very fulfilling. It's not sad. It's not a satisfying answer. So, but I put it aside and I thought, okay, it's just what it is. And uh, perhaps, like I said, I'm not smart enough. But after many years, of course, now I was uh, late thirties, I was writing this book. And then I, of course, I had to make this comparison between the concept of God in Christianity, but also in Islam. So when I was writing about Christianity, those questions popped up again. I said, oh yeah, that's, <laughs> that was it. That was something with the Trinity and all. And then it all came back to me, but on another level, so to say. And at the same time, because I was writing against Islam, and of course I, I, I knew the theology basically because of my studies in a comparative religion, but I never saw Islam like, like an alternative for the truth with a capital T. It was just an object of study and I wanted to know more because I hated it and I wanted to have like ammunition to do something against it. So I had to know some basic stuff. But now, when I saw these, this, this concept of Tawhid explained uh, from um, sources that weren't per se anti-Islam, mm -hmm. that changed a little bit of how I saw this concept. And then uh, I got so many questions in the end, and I thought, well, it has to be correct. Because although I wanted to have uh, this anti-Islam book, I said, well, it has to be correct. I cannot make any mistakes because otherwise people will laugh at me. And it was kind of... a uh, also a nafs uh, thing, a nafs thing, you know, yeah. when mm. it's your ego, it has to be correct. You don't want to be uh, embarrassed. So I started writing all these authorities on Islam. And one of the persons I wrote was Abdul Hakim Murad uh, from Cambridge University, Sheikh. Mm. But I did, in the beginning, I didn't know who he was. So um, I put a little Wikipedia uh, uh, link in my uh, email so he would know who I was because I didn't want to trick him or uh, that he said, well, who are you? But of course, later on, I thought to myself, it's kind of strange that an anti-Islam politician, and I wasn't that anti-Islam anymore when I wrote him, but I still was pretty anti. And of course, I was known for my anti-Islam uh, political um, uh, activities uh, from another country. And I'm asking this professor from the UK to help me writing my anti-Islam book. So it was it kind was of shocking. strange. <laughs> yeah. And it took, it took many, many uh, uh, weeks but uh, one Saturday night, I got this uh, very extensive email uh, from him, and he started explaining a lot of things. He said, well, perhaps you can read this book, that article, ask this person, ask that person. And I, uh, he, he uh, answered some questions I had directly, and then we mailed over, uh, I mailed him, he answered me. And in the end, uh, what it was, he said, well, if you reread all your old books, your anti-Islam books, uh, then you feel this anti-Islam fight, probably. But when you do that, please read these books and these articles, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, at the same time. So they said, well, you, you will see that the articles and the books that you read from an anti-Islam perspective, most of them were written by non-Muslim. And Orientalists, yeah. Oriental. And people from way, way back, because I was, like I said, not kind of a nerdy guy, so I read the, the original anti-Islam scripts mm. <laughs> from Europe. So uh, the Dutch, the, the, uh, the German, the French, the English, all these books. Uh, but of course, they were all written by non-Muslims. So he said, well, when, when you studied the books, you will see that uh, in the end, they twisted sometimes stories or they add something that wasn't in it or they left something out. And he said, it wasn't always on purpose. Sometimes they just really didn't know. He said, like, you, you will see that there will you almost have two Islams in a way. Mm -hmm. You have the Islam, the real deal, and you have Islam from the Orientalist and the people who weren't uh, Muslim anyway, uh, but try to explain it as a subject of study, for example, mm -hmm. or to explain why it was wrong from a Christian theological perspective. So 
Um, that's it. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, brother. I mean, I wanted to ask you a question. What's one thing that maybe you've learned about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that really kind of corrected your belief or something that just stood out to you? Yeah, yeah, there was there was a, a lot <laughs> uh, because um, of course after I accepted, so to say, the the Tawheed concept in Islam, mm -hmm. uh, because I was re-reading the Bible after. Uh, with the information of Islam. So I, I started, in the end, I thought, well, perhaps there is something about this monotheism in the Islamic sense. And then I thought, well, if it is true, I have to, I can find it in the Bible as well. So I was, mm -hmm. and of course, I was still a Christian then. So I was reading the Bible again, and then I saw, and I thought, well, I don't have to look at what other people say that Jesus said, but there are, in the New Testament, there are some quotes, mm -hmm. and they say, Jesus said. It's like, like a Hadith uh, style. Yeah. So, and there was this, there's this uh, narrative, this story where there's this man coming to Jesus and he asks him, oh, a good man, what do I have to do to uh, get into paradise? And then Jesus tells this person, don't call me good. There's only one good. And that that's not him. He, he says, oh. it's God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, he says, the second thing is that love your neighbor as you want to be, uh, treat your neighbor as you want to be treated yourself. Uh, but I thought to myself, well, if Jesus himself, uh, he, he talks about this one God, then perhaps there is something in it. And then I started rereading the Old Testament, so to say, part one of the Bible, the same Bible that the Jews have. And there's this monotheism, one God, one God, one God. And there's this this uh, this passage in the New Testament as well. Then someone asked this the same question, Jesus, and he says, uh, the first thing that he says is, "Oh Israel, here, oh Israel, your God is one. There is one God." And I thought, well, if Jesus himself, uh, Jesus himself, uh, repeatedly talks about this one God concept, mm -hmm. and I find it in the Old Testament, and the Muslims talk about, it, perhaps there is some truth in it. So in the end, I accepted it. I said, okay. Perhaps this is true. It is just one God, and Jesus is not God. But of course, uh, like you said, there was still the the person of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. That I I thought he was a warlord. That was the only concept I had in my mind when I thought about him. I thought, okay, he had a sword and he liked to kill people. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. Um, but then, of course, I started reading books from the Muslim tradition, so to say, the Islamic tradition about him. And one of the first books that I read was from Martin Lynx. Oh, uh, it was it's called Anwit. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Uh, it's laid his life based on the earliest sources. And that was for the first time that I saw him not only as a warlord, but I saw him, like you said, like a father, but also like a friend, like a neighbor, and like as a teacher. So I saw him as a man complete man, not just a picture or a cartoon almost, because that's what was in my head. But now I saw him as the person that he was. And then I was reading about his life and I, I came across the story of Hint. And uh, Hint, of course, she was the wife of Abu Sufyan, a, a big enemy of Islam. And she, um, and it's a, the summary and correct me if I don't say it uh, correct. Uh, uh, she gave money to a person to kill Hamza, the favorite uncle of the prophet on the battlefield. And it was that what, what happened. Uh, he, he got killed and they cut off his nose and his ears. I even uh, take a bite from his body. And so he was, he was uh, horrible. It was horrible what happened. And of course, the prophet was very sad. Uh, and years and years later, uh, Muhammad, peace and blessings uh, be upon him, came into power in Mecca. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, now Hint, and Hint was still there because some Sahaba came to him and said, well, Hint is still here, what do you do with her? So I thought, okay, now she will get uh, crucified or burnt or whatever. Yeah, revenge in a way. And, and he said, well, I cannot look at her right now because of what happened, but bloodshedding is over. So she can leave if she want to leave. And if she want to stay among the Muslims, these are the new rules, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought to myself, well, that's very remarkable because in my mind, he was the most horrible person on earth. Mm -hmm. And if even normal, uh, friendly guys, if someone kills my, my favorite relative and I'm able to kill that person, I probably kill the person. Of course, I, I, it's not something you should do, but and that's the emotion. Yeah, of course, it, because uh, we're, we're weak in a way. Um, but he didn't. And and the fact that he was able to, because he was all powerful in a way, when it came to Mecca in that time, and, thought, and I thought to myself, okay, 
he can, he's able to kill her or punish her or do whatever, and he doesn't do it. So that that really was like a trigger. I thought this, this man is not the man I thought he was. So that was for me was that was the first step of trying to uh, get to know him. And then of course, yeah, I read I read so many uh, beautiful stories uh, about him and and how his character was that was was really beautiful. So in the end, although I didn't want it, I almost fell in love with the concept of Islam because of his character. And cool. that in the end, I felt well, I I still don't believe he is like a prophet. So I started making a comparison between uh, prophets from the Old Testament and from uh, from Islam. And so, I, for example, I, I compared them to Moses and to Joshua. And mm. in the end, I thought, well, what are my arguments for them being a prophet and for him not being a prophet? And I said, if I'm very honest to myself, I have to have the same um, uh, same arguments for him as I have for them. Yeah. Any other way around. So that's what, I, and in the end, I thought, well, all the things I compared to when it comes to character, when it came to the way they, uh, even the way they waged war, everything was better with Muhammad. So in the end, I thought to myself, he is a prophet, or they all are not prophets, or he is also a prophet. So I thought to myself, he then he is a prophet, because I don't have any arguments to say he's not, because there's some uh, predictions uh, of his came true. Uh, his character was, was beautiful. He preached one God, one God. He explained, he lived, he, he, he practiced what he preached, so to say. Uh, everything in his surroundings was was remarkable. So I thought to myself, okay, he is a prophet. But then, of course, I thought, oh, that's that's horrible because I now say there is one God, a Muhammad. <laughs> you're on, you're, you're taking uh, shahada. You literally <laughs> get the yeah. Of, of course, I know that it's shahada. Uh, <laughs> so I thought that's a horrible thing. And well, here in the back of my uh, uh, living room, there was this big um, uh, closet with a lot of books on top of the shelf and. Uh, in the end, there were all these books on the table. And I thought, well, after the realization that I thought, well, perhaps he is a prophet, prophet. and I say, yeah, then, then, and that's just going the wrong direction. Of course, I didn't hate Islam anymore, but I thought, well, I don't want to be a Muslim, a of Muslim. course, because that would be very strange. And I put all the books away, and one of the books, because a lot of books fell from the shelf because it was too full, there were too many books. And one of the books that fell from the shelf was the Quran. It sounds a little bit like fairy tale, but <laughs> it really happened. So I, when I picked it up, it was like, it was uh, open with with the contents down. So the uh, so I picked it up with my thumb and my thumb was on uh, Surah 22, verse 46, Ayah 46. And it said in the translation, it's not the eyes that are blind, but the hearts. Oh, and then I thought to myself, yeah, that really is my problem because I really can see what I've written down, I could, I, I understood what I've written down. Nobody forced me to write the book, but I still didn't want to be a Muslim. So it was something else. It was not a, a rational, uh, a rational thing. It was some, it was an emotional thing. It was something from the heart. So, and then I made like a, like a little dua. Uh, of course I was not a uh, Muslim yet, but like a little prayer and I said, Oh Lord, I don't care if it's the uh, it's the, the truth is from Christianity or Islam, but just give me a sign so I know the truth and that I know what what direction I have to go. And I was exp uh, I was expecting like an angel or something, but of course <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> so I went to bed and uh, when I woke up the next day, I felt very secure. I felt very secure and thought to myself, well, I think I I'll be Muslim. I, I think I'll convert so, to Islam. And all the doubts were gone, and of course, you had a lot of doubts, but I felt very strong, and then, of course, I uh, I uh, started telling people, and the first one I told was my wife. SubhanAllah, Brother Joram, that's, you know, it's always incredible to hear these things that just happen. Allah puts it uh, for people like that, and it's in their path, and what's meant for them is meant for them, SubhanAllah. Um, Brother Joram, I wanted to ask you, there's, we now we see a wave of people converting. Um, you may be familiar with um, a former priest, Brother Hilarion, who just converted. Um, he was a Russian Orthodox priest. Like, I don't know how you get more traditional in the Christian school of thought than that. Like, that's amazing. And for us in Australia, yeah. we've had former far right um, uh, persona, uh, Sherman uh, Burgess, who was, you know, at his height a couple, like not too long ago. Yeah. 
why do you, what is this attraction to Islam that you find people from different paths uh, are coming towards? Why do you think it's what does Islam offer to people from such backgrounds, whether it be a v- ultra traditional or, tr- or traditional or from ultra far right? Uh, well, in the end, I think it's because it's the truth <laughs> with a capital T, because in the end, that, that's what attracts you. And uh, of course, people have many arguments, many reasons. Uh, for me, uh, I was, of course, a, pr- uh, a practicing Christian. So it wasn't, it had a lot of people say, did it have anything to do with politics? But it, mm-hmm. for me, it didn't have had anything to do with politics. It was really a theological journey for me. So, and, and other people might have other reasons or other journeys, and I don't know them, of course. Uh, but in the end, I think what, what attracts people to Islam is the truth. Uh, Allah uh, said this is the only religion in a way, the only true religion. So in the end, we all have like fitra. So you're attracted to this The innate this truth. disposition to know God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the, I think, uh, but of course, I don't know uh, any better than you, but I think that that is it. And uh, yeah, why are so many right-wing or traditional persons? Yeah, I think because uh, that it, when it comes to Christianity, I think it has to do with, there are there is truth in Christianity, of course, as well, just like mm-hmm. there is in Judaism, but it's not the complete truth. So some things are changed, a little, like the concept of tahrif from, Maybe uh, some things are added, some things are left out or twisted mm-hmm. or whatever, but there is this truth in it. So in the end, if you meet the real truth, then you recognize it. You say, oh yeah, that's it. So for me, it was like, it was really like coming home. It was like a puzzle. Wow. Like I had always trying to puzzle and in the end, it fits. And then it felt very, like I said, it felt very complete. And a lot of people always say, well, Islam means peace. Uh, of course, it means um, in a, in a literal sense, it doesn't mean peace. But I know because it is the same the same root word, of course, SLM. Uh, but that really is what I experienced, and I still experience when I think of the fact that we have Islam. That oh, the, the thought only of having Islam all already starts calming me. So, yeah, read it's it's uh, still feels very. Uh, I feel very happy. Mashallah. Jerome, we began the podcast by asking you what was your life like before Islam, during the far right days of your life and during the far right polit- political stage of your life. The J days. Yeah. What, are, what is your life like yeah. now as a Muslim, as a husband, as a, as a father? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'm, uh, I'm very happy. Um, I think most people uh, who live with me are very happy as well. And... Um, my mo- my mother told me uh, not too long ago that she uh, still didn't like the fact that I became Muslim, but she said, "I like you. You're sweeter as a Muslim son than as a Christian son." <laughs> so that was 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 uh, yeah, well, it was very sweet in a way. It was like a insult and and a compliment in one. <laughs> mm-hmm. But that's that's mothers can do that, of course. Uh, yeah, the, no, I. Uh, yeah, I'm still very happy that I uh, that I took shahada and that I became Muslim. It, I, it's the only real decision that I made in my life. That I really, I, I never made a decision that I thought about three years in the end, and that I wrote a book about. And because some people say, "Well, hey, aren't you going to convert to Hinduism or whatever religion uh, in a later stage of your life?" And I said, no, because, and they said, well, but you used to be a Christian. I said, yeah, but when I was a Christian, it was not my decision. I, mm. I was born, born a Christian in a way. Yeah, mm. because they, my, my, my parents raised me that way. I'm very grateful for the way I was brought up and uh, they're very sweet, etc. But that was not my decision. The only time that I made a decision when it comes to religion was me becoming a Muslim. And I did that very, very, I, I, I never thought about anything so deep and so low mm-hmm. uh, so yeah that, that makes you very firm when it comes to being muslim and accepting and embracing islam so uh, i'm very happy and uh, alhamdulillah i hope that i'll be a muslim till i die and after it and i hope all the people in my uh, surroundings in my in my family all my friends that they become muslim yeah of course it, uh, you don't know but that's mm-hmm. what we hope brother Jerome, i want to get your final remarks on this wonderful conversation Everyone's on their own path, struggling to find God, whether it be from you know a Muslim perspective or a non-Muslim perspective. What advice would you have for people who are seeking an interest into Islam? What can Islam offer 
to the lay person, to someone who's removed far away and has no idea in Islam, but perhaps seeking an interest in, and to those who are seeking an interest, what does Islam offer to someone like that? Oh, the end, what it offers is, uh, yeah, is peace, <laughs> peace of heart and mind. Because when I was a Christian, I always had this like a struggle between heart and mind because I really wanted to believe, for example, the Trinity mm -hmm. and the whole Christian dogma concept. But in my heart, I, I couldn't. If I was really honest back then, I knew I wasn't like, so to say, 100%. It was like 90 or 92. Uh, and the day I became Muslim and I embraced Islam with heart and might, that was how it felt because like the, the disconnection that there always was gone. So I really could believe what I wanted to believe and what I wanted to believe was really there in my heart as well. So it, it makes you uh, complete uh, in a way, in a, in, a, in, a, in a religious sense, so to say. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that that's what it offers you, and of course, yeah, uh, we all hope that it offers you something more in the in the akhirah, in the the life uh, after this life, of course. But for here in the dunya, it it, it gives you uh, it gives you peace of mind, peace of heart. I it, it gives you direction. Uh, so yeah, I I recommend Islam to everybody. <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. And I feel like as a Christian coming to Islam, it's not like you're throwing out everything. Mm -hmm. You've still got the prophets. You've got a love for Jesus, yeah. a love for Isa alayhi yeah. salam. You've got all the prophets of the tradition. You've got Moses, Moses. Noah. You've got everyone. Right. You've just got that final piece of the puzzle, Muhammad sallallahu yeah, that's alayhi wasallam. Yeah, really. Yeah, it's like like a cherry on the on the cake. And uh, it, it, it's it's it, what's 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 in the Islamic tradition uh, today. I completed your religion. That is it. it that's mm. really it. And especially when you're from the uh, uh, Judeo uh, or Christian tradition, when you after you been there and you see Islam and you embrace Islam, and then you see yeah, it's it's like part one, two, and the final chapter that oh, every saga. everything that was. Yeah, it, well, it really, it's really like a saga. All the <laughs> things that weren't clear in part one and two yeah. were clarified in part three. You've got to wait to the finale. Yeah. You've got to stick to the end. Like, you have to wait. Yeah, no, in a way. In a way, yeah. Jazakallah <laughs> khairan. Brother Jerome, it's been a phenomenal discussion. It I've really has. It. I've, I've really enjoyed it. And like I said, you know, we worked so hard uh, for, for both of us to be here and alhamdulillah that God was able to allow us and to facilitate this beautiful message and to everyone at home I really hope that this message you know for me it really it really stuck to me and I really hope it brings a benefit to all those watching at home thank you to all those watching at home it's been an honor if you have any other guests that you'd like to see on this podcast please do let us know in the comments brother Jerome any final comments before we leave now I would like to thank you for the time and for all the good work you do, you have a great, uh, a great podcast here. So uh, please, uh, uh, yeah, well, stay there and uh, work, work, do your work, and uh, may may Allah bless you all. And uh, I, yeah, I really enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those at home and assalamu alaikum.